Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Barn Theatre. And welcome to our talk, little chat this evening, a humorous look at travelling. Now, I'm quite aware that in the last few months, we haven't done much travelling. So this evening will be not what we have done, not what we could be doing, but it will be a look at silliness and a few facts about the wonderful world of leaving our home, shutting the door, getting on a plane or a train and going somewhere. And so, once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived an elderly lady who will say well, she's about 84, 85. She lived in a little hamlet in rural England, miles and miles and miles away from anywhere, and she had never been travelling. She knew what travelling was because she had a television, and she could see by the television travelling programmes that there was a great big world out there that she'd never seen. And if she didn't hurry up and get out there, she would never see. But I'm not talking about her going to look at monuments and mountains and trekking in the Himalayas. Her main wish, and she had seen on the television, were hotels. She longed to stay in a hotel. So she popped down to the local post office where her friend Maud worked. And Maud was a bit more worldly than our elderly lady. And she said to Maud, could you book me into a hotel, please? And Maud thought, well, this was very adventurous. So she took the largest town nearby that was accessible and easy for our lady to get to, and she booked her a room in the hotel. Now, when I say a room, obviously, yes, it would be a room as we would know a hotel room, but our friend was very, very particular that this room would have tea making facilities because she loved when she saw these programs that people in these hotel rooms had a kettle and they had cups and teaspoons and all kinds of tea and if they were very lucky they would have a sachet to make themselves an instant cocoa before they went to bed. Anyway the day came and our friend had packed her little suitcase and all the things she might need for this wonderful outing. Maud had booked her a taxi because this hotel in this town was at least a good 80 miles away. Anyway, in she got, into the taxi full of trepidation. She arrived at the hotel. She went in through the hotel room uh, door and she approached the reception desk. And the receptionist was a charming woman. Yes, her name was down, her room was booked. And the young woman called over and said, this is John and he will carry your suitcase for you to the room. Oh, what luxury, our friend thought. And she followed John and he showed her in. She was horrified, absolutely horrified. Young man, she cried, where are the tea making facilities? This is all I've come for, the tea, and there are... Madam, the young man replied, this is the lift. <laughs> now, travel today is no longer thought of as a luxury. We can get on a plane, we can get a boat, any other form of transport for adventure, education and pleasure. And it's quite commonplace, if we can afford it. And of course, travelling for any of these reasons, as I say, is now ordinary. Not as it was many, many years ago, extraordinary. I say many, many years ago, in the early 1970s, a young woman called Arlene Bloom decided that she would like to go on an expedition. She saw that people were trekking through the Himalayas, they were going through the, hacking their way through jungles, etc., etc. And she looked in the Times newspaper and she saw that these expeditions were on offer and people were invited to go up to London, speak to the expedition organizers and get a place. Now there was a snag, Arlene by the name, was a woman. Now, I want you to bear in mind that this is the early 1970s. 
Every expedition she wanted to go on, because she was a woman, she was turned down. And these were the reasons. She wasn't allowed to go on an expedition to the Himalayas because her presence would upset the tenting arrangements. She was turned, uh, turned down for a trip across Afghanistan in case she upset the mood of the men when they were socializing together. And she could not go to Alaska because she would become emotionally unstable at high altitudes. And she was far too ladylike to go to Russia. And finally, she was told that she would never she would never ever be considered to accompany an expedition because women became too eager and too excited. This in turn impairs their judgment and she would become a constant danger to her fellow men adventurers. Needless to say, Arlene went on to form her own expedition company, which only had women in, and I'd like to be a fly on the wall if ever a man turned up to ask if he could come. So, okay, traveling. The biggest invention and help for traveling was the train. And now we're going to take ourselves back to 1889, and we're going to go on a train journey, because this was a wonderful and magical way of getting from one end of our country right to the other end, and to see things that we had never seen before. But we have to be prepared. Remember 1889. Victorian times. Now, all this preparation I'm going to give you comes from a wonderful book by Lillian Campbell Davidson, and it's entitled Hints to Travellers, Men and Ladies at Home and Abroad. And it's from this hint book that we can conjure up a picture of what it is like to travel then and how we must prepare. And prepare we must. So, first of all, we're going to determine that we're well off, okay? We're well off, and we're going to travel first class. We have a maid, although, of course, the maid will not be travelling with us. She'll be down the other end in cattle class, and um, unfortunately, very difficult to get hold of whilst on a train journey, and that is why the majority of stuff that Lillian suggests we take with us, Lillian would actually have in the carriage with her. Now, so we're going to say we're going to go from King's Cross, which was a newly built, beautiful railway station, and we're going to go as far as the train can take us up to almost the top end of Scotland, and it's going to take days absolute days. So, what to wear. Now, this is for the ladies amongst you, because I really couldn't care less what the men are wearing, but as I'm a woman, I'm going to say ladies. Now, and this is, I've taken this from the book, so this is all due to Lillian. Our dress will always be simple. Oh, and you guys that are here, and any of you guys are listening, if you want to go in ladies' attire on a long train journey, then, you know, just whip out and buy these few things. Right, our dress should always be simple and inconspicuous, aimed at heavy usage and the inevitable grime of the train. Colour and design of our garment must not be noticeable or out of place, amongst the general travelling public. It must be quiet and plain, so that it's not to startle the gaze of the beholder. Our underwear should give us the greatest degree of warmth. It's generally acknowledged that for health reasons, there is nothing as excellent as wool next to the skin. However, if the weather is very warm, then this thick-set wool can be replaced by merino wool, which is thinner, and it could be lined with Indian gauze for even greater comfort. And to be aware, ladies, that about this time, the boon for knickers was invented, and that boon was the double cotton gusset. Okay? 
all right? However, the drawback to wearing all this wool and undergarments is that it's one is away from home the care needed in the washing of. So if you do have to use a washerwoman um, who might not know the needs of rinsing through your merino wool or your thick wool, it is best to have written out instructions. But the only problem is that the further up the country you get, the less likely it will be that washerwomen can actually read. So, so it would be a very good idea to take on your journey that will last these few days, brown paper and string, okay? So that when your soiled undergarments do get soiled and you can't wear them anymore, you can get your maid to wrap them up in the brown paper and the string, and when you're at a station, pass them over and they can be sent back home for the washing. Right, now stockings should always be woolen when traveling in the winter, and however, they can be replaced by silk in the warmer weather. And white petticoats are totally unsuitable for travel. So if you're going to wear petticoats, and of course you must, have it in a striped material, and then it won't show the dirt so much. Your main gown, most usable, is a plain muted color, tailored gown of mixed tweed, dark gray or brown. And for the summer, a beige or good nun's veiling would be very comfortable. And the make cannot ever be too plain. Now, to complete our wardrobe, a close, short lace veil is great protection to our eyes from dust, wind, and flying cinders. And also, it enables a man not to have eye contact with us. Um, and it keeps the hair tidy. And finally, for summer traveling, a dust coat that would go over everything, usually made of linen or silk. It can be readily made by ones made from a very simple pattern. And this coat should reach the hem of the gown and trimmed, and this is what it says in the book, trimmed with yak lace. Well, what the hell is yak to lace? I mean, the only th reference I can find is, is a large domesticated wild ox with shaggy hair and large horns, and it lives in Tibet. But it hasn't got any lace hanging about it. Oh, and the boots, if you wear boots, they must be laced boots. They can't be button boots, because buttons could pop off and land in very embarrassing places. I hesitate to think where a button might land. Now, when we go on holiday, <clears throat> we like to take things with us. My husband would say that when we went on holiday, I was prepared for every eventuality, okay? Which I think is only wise, because you never know. So. Remember, we're still on our long train journey. And remember that all this stuff has got to be with you, men and ladies, in the carriage. Your maid's down there. You can have no contact with her. So this is what we're going to take. This is what we've been advised that we must take. Does anybody know what an Etna is? No. No. An Etna and we're taking this with us, is a small portable cooking apparatus which uses methylated spirits. And I'll read you what Lillian says about the Etna stove and methylated spirits. One of the most frequently felt wants in traveling is that of hot water. And it is a want which is by no means always as easy to satisfy as its simplicity would seem to promise, especially at night. It's often experienced when kitchen fires are out and no method of heating can be readily applied. Now, I'm assuming she stares, says this because this long train journey, she's getting off, one would hope. She's getting off and staying in hotels, so that's where the kitchen fire would be out. Therefore, the so-called Etnas, or apparatus for quickly supplying boiling water, is most invaluable, and no traveller should be without one of these truly indispensable articles. 
Methylated spirits, and bear in mind you've got to carry bottles of methylated spirits as well, can be carried as fuel, and it is best to arm oneself with sufficient quantity to last out the whole journey. Because if one goes off the beaten track, methylated spirits is impossible to find. A railway key. Now, when people travelled on trains in 1889, the carriages were locked. You know, no health and safety, the carriages were locked. And if you had, didn't have a railway key, and the train was longer than the station platform, or there was no porter or nothing, and you wanted to get off, you couldn't, because you couldn't unlock the door. So a railway key could be purchased from a bookstore on the railway station so you could get out the train. You also have to take, now I don't need you to take notes for this because you won't need any of this, but anyway, meat lozenges or meat jellies for use when not feeling well. Cocoa cubes, tin opener, tea and coffee, tins of meat, fruit and vegetables. And Lillian points out that there's our particular use in the mountains of Wales, vegetables. I mean, for goodness, anyway, never mind, uh, and, uh, and the coast of Ireland, and, and she refers to the Scottish Highlands. Soiled linen bags for our soiled linen. They can be purchased from Barrett and Sons, and they form a bit of luggage which is by no means unsightly, and the possession of which is a source of endless comfort to the traveller. And they also have the convenience of being, when full, posted back like in the brown paper and the string. Foot warmers and hand warmers of either tin or copper. A hot water bottle. I take hot water bottles everywhere. Medic a medicinal measuring glass. Brandy. Sol volatile, if I pronounce that correctly, and smelling salts. A fold-up fan, an eau de cologne, an unlimited stock of cotton pocket handkerchiefs with your initials on, of course, and glycerin to swallow against the dust. Now, a medicine chest. Also, when I go on holiday, I'm almost a surgeon. I have everything for fixing my capped teeth in, to, um, well, everything anybody will need. Stuff to make you go, stuff to make you stop, um, headache pills, muscle relaxant pills, um, itchy, anything and everything. So Lillian tells us that we must be prepared with a few simple medicines in case of sudden need. So here is the list. If you recognize anything, please put your hand up. Lamplu's paletic saline, Eno's fruit salts, mm. quinine pills, mm. Vaseline, mm. Cockles pills, no. Holloway's pills, Holloway's ointments, Dover's powder pills, Colocynth and Colchium pills, Pepsine pills, a lot of bloody pills, Camphor pills, Sidits powders, glycerine, mm. Mm. Insect powder, mm. Mm. sal volatile or volatile, whatever you prefer, methylated spirits, sanitas, tamar indienne, eau de cologne, mm. friar's balsam, mm. 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 chlorodine. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you, you going to render somebody unconscious? Tincture of arnica. Fair enough, yes. Essence of camphor, yes. Oiled silk. What would you use oiled silk for? Don't know. Mustard leaves. Mustard leaves? Are those for boils and things, maybe? Mustard leaves. Cough lozenges. Court plaster. Caustic soda. <laughs> Leave it at that. Oh, and she also tells us what we're not allowed to eat. Always hot food in cold weather, especially soup. So you've got to take your own soup with you on the journey. And as one has heard such ghastly tales of station soup that many people shrink from the mere idea of eating railway soup. And if soup is difficult on a train journey, then opt for a slice of meat accompanied by potatoes. 
not veg or fruit, because these must be fresh and one never knows, especially if they are bought, purchased from a railway station buffet and never, ever eat pastry. <laughs> Wine sparingly and only spirits if one feels ill. Well, I make sure I feel ill all the time so I can drink that. Plain buns, <laughs> plain buns are really the only harmless style of refreshment but not the ordinary railway buns. A small sandwich is acceptable, provided it's not a ham one, and delicately cut sandwiches are a temptation to the appetite rather than ones that have still got the crusts on and they've got crumbly edges, um, which would rob all desire of one's food. And a small flask of milk or claret with water. Now, Lillian is aware that a woman's solid meal consists of a cup of tea and a lightly boiled egg, but would point out that a feeble appetite is not conducive for travelling. So to prevent fatigue, it's useful to provide oneself with an extract of meat lozenge to suck continually while you're on your train journey to give you strength and to fight fatigue. But you must not touch salt and pepper. So we're going to leave Lillian on this journey surrounded by all these tins of everything and these pills and everything and all I can say is thank goodness we don't have to take this stuff anymore. So now we're going to move to the 21st century. You know easy jet, the planes, well I'm going to call this difficult jet. And this is a scenario of when a chap boards his plane ready for his journey, travelling to exciting places. How welcome aboard a la car air, sir. May I see your ticket? Oh yes, of course. Oh, I see you're in seat 12B, sir. That would be five pounds. Why? Well, for telling you where to sit, sir. But I already knew where to sit. Oh, nevertheless, we are now charging a seat locator fee of five pounds, and it's the airline's new policy. Well, that is the most stupid thing I've ever heard, and I will not pay it. Oh, sir, you do want a seat on this fly or, or not? Uh, yes, yes, all right, I'll pay. But the airline is going to hear about this. Oh, thank you so much. My goodness, your carry-on bag looks heavy. Would you like me to stow it in the overhead compartment for you, sir? Oh, yes, please. That would be great. Thank you. Oh, that's no problem, sir. Up we go. Oh, done that. That will be £10, please. <laughs> what? This airline now charges a £10 carry-on assistance fee. This is extortion. I will not stand for it. Oh, actually, sir, you're right. You can't stand. You need to sit. Fasten your seatbelt. We're about to push back from the gate. But first, I will need that £10. No way. Sir, if you don't comply, I will be forced to call the air marshal. And you really don't want me to do that now, do you, sir? Oh, why? Why not? Why? What's he going to do? Shoot me? No, no, sir, but you will be charged a £50 air marshalling hailing fee. Oh, oh, all right, all right, take the £10. I just cannot believe this. Oh, thank you for your cooperation, sir. Now, now that you are seated, is there anything else I can do for you? Yes, it is rather stuffy, and my overhead fan doesn't seem to work. Could you fix it? Oh, your overhead fan's not broken, sir. It's just, well, you have to insert a 50p piece into the overhead coin slot for the first five minutes. The airline is charging me for cabin air. Oh, of course not, sir. Stagnant cabin air is free of charge. It's the circulating air that costs the 50p. I don't have a 50p piece. Have you changed for a pound coin? Oh, certainly, sir. Here you go. 
my pleasure. But you're only giving me 75 pence. Oh, so, well, there is a change-making fee of 25 pence. Oh, for heaven's sake. All the change I have left now on me is a 20p piece. And what the hell can I do with that? I should hang on to that, dear, because you might be using the lavatory later. <laughs> How many people have been to Butlins? No? No of Butlins. Yes, no of Butlins. Well, Billy Butlin grew up in Canada came to Britain as a young man and grew wealthy as the European agent for Dodgem cars. Through the Dodgem business, he met Harry Warner, a retired army captain who owned an amusement park and restaurant at Hailing Island on the Hampshire coast, not far from Bognor Regis. And Butlins took over the running of this amusement park in 1928 and then got the idea of Holiday Camp, a place where people could come and spend a week in a giant compound beside the sea for an affordable, all-inclusive price. Now, on the site of a former turnip field just outside Skegness, he opens Butlin's first holiday camp in the country and others followed. Church groups, youth clubs and trade unions, they all opened camps. And the British Union of Fascists had two. Butlin's old associate, Captain Warner, opened several camps of his own, as did a businessman called Fred Ponting. It was extraordinary that people paid to go to them. Campers were awakened by a loudspeaker in their room, which they could neither turn down or turn off. They were summoned to meals in communal dining halls, harried into taking part in humiliating competitions, and ordered back to their chalets to be locked in for the night at 11 p.m. Butlin had invented the prisoner of war camp, and this being Britain, people loved it. The chalets were tiny, but they had a carpet, electric light, running water, and a maid service. And these were luxuries that most customers had never before enjoyed, often in their own homes. Outside, there was a bathroom for every four campers, well, every four huts. For an inclusive price of three pounds a week, patrons could get three meals a day. Evening entertainment, which could run from Shakespeare, ballroom dancing, archery, bowls, and pony riding. It's hard to understand the appeal, although an article by Sonia Dawson, an historian who studied holiday camps in the 20th century Britain, might give the answer. She writes, Many of the waitresses were prostitutes, which fitted well with Buckland's slogan, Butlins, where you will meet the kind of people you would like to meet. Sex was rampant. Employees bonked other employees and as many guests as they could. At some camps, employees had a scoring system. Five to sleep with a female guest, ten for the beauty contest winner, and fifteen for the camp manager's wife. Groups of unchaperoned teenagers came purely for the prospect of sex with other unchaperoned teenagers. And the post-war years were the golden years for camps. But by the early 60s, two and a half million people a year were staying in holiday camps. But with the advent of cheap train travel and package holidays, Butlins faded away as did the Warner holiday camps, and it's only been in the last 15 years they have come back again, but I don't want to know. Is it still rampant sex <laughs> at the Warner holiday camps? Now, gentlemen, um, and ladies as well, so you could reverse this, um, there comes a time in our lives when our children start to consider putting us into a care home. Well, before I came here this evening, I signed a contract. And that contract was for, and I'm talking to the gentleman here and the gentleman at home. Um, well, you'll see, as I tell you, what is going to happen for you. You're going to go on a cruise. So 
So instead of going into a care home, you're going to go on what would be almost a permanent cruise, men only. And it is an alternative to sheltered accommodation. It's cheaper than a nursing home, cheaper than a home for the bewildered, and is far superior to any care in the community that anybody, any institution has to offer. Sign the contract. I've advised your children, your grandchildren, your wives, and your next of kin. They seemed very, very pleased and were very smiley and jolly at this news and that you will be having this opportunity to travel and said how much they would miss you and did they and did I have any idea how long actually you would be away. <laughs> so, these are the advantages. For the price of £270 a day, inclusive, which is a bargain, as nursing homes can cost up to nearly £1,000. Food is available all day, and there are 10 restaurants on board. Meals can be served in your cabin if you don't want to venture out. There are three swimming pools and a gym if you feel energetic. There's entertainment every night, and the good news is this finishes at 8.30 p.m. Further education classes are available. On offer is Bible study classes, the art of napkin folding, identifying pasta shapes, fashion for the over 70s, fly fishing secrets, the effect dairy products can have on an elderly digestive system, and so on and so on. All your washing and ironing will be done, free toiletries every day, you will be a customer, not a patient. New men will come on board every 7 to 14 days, and you will make lots of friends, and so obviously never have to pay for drinks. Clean sheets, towels, every day. The bad news is there aren't any women. And you might think that this is, some men amongst you might think this is very good news. However, the company, they did tell me, were aware of the fact that you, many men might feel a bit deprived of female company. And they've taken this on board, <laughs> on board, and they have decided that every third port of call, a selective number of suitable women are invited on board for a couple of hours, um, companionship for the gentleman. However, I will point out that on reading the terms and conditions prior to signing the contact, I was mindful of the heading visiting females and the conditions that follow. Absolutely no physical contact other than a formal handshake on greeting. And the services that will be provided with no deviation are trimming of toenails and nose hair. Right? Light conversation on the weather and the problems of climate change. Reading aloud together from classical literature and poetry. Perusal of photographs of your grandchildren. And if you don't have any grandchildren, then photographs of your gardens will be quite acceptable. Tea and cake will be available. Under no circumstances will alcohol be consumed. And if there is time permitting, after you've gone through this wonderful gamut of conversation and stuff to do, and depending on the length of your nose and your ear hair, if there's time permitting, your female companions will sort your socks into pairs. <laughs> okay? And the best bit is the countries you will visit, Australia, New Zealand, the Caribbean, the list is endless. Now, if you're unfortunate enough to pass away while on the cruise, there is an advantage. No funeral costs. You're wrapped up in your bedding and you're thrown overboard. And your family are invited, of course, to witness the throwing over. And there is a helicopter landing pad on board the ship. And also, they'll get a mini cruise at your expense. So I'm sure all you gentlemen are going to sign up. April the 14th. You've got to tell me this. Where are we? Okay. April the 14th, 1912. Latitude 41 degrees to 46 north, longitude 50 degrees to 14 degrees west. The breakfast on board that morning, baked apples, fresh fruit, stewed prunes, Quaker oats, boiled hominy, puffed rice, fresh herring finned and haddock, 
and smoked salmon, grilled mutton kidneys and bacon, grilled ham and sausages, lamb, vegetable stew, fried shredded poached or boiled eggs, plain or tomato omelette to order, sirloin steak or mutton chops to order, mashed saute or jacket potatoes, cold meats, Vienna and Graham rolls, soda and sultana rolls, cornbread, buckwheat cakes, blackcurrant conserve, Narbonne honey, Oxford marmalade, watercress. And this was all served on the morning of the 14th of April, 1912. Where were we? We were on the Titanic. And I would say, as sad and horrible as that event was, if anybody at their breakfast had got through all of that, all of them, notices, <laughs> foreign countries, um, misinterpretation from the home language to English. Notices in hotel bedrooms. Please to bathe inside the tub. You are invited to take advantage of the chambermaid. Because of the impropriety of entertaining guests of the opposite sex in the bedroom, it is suggested that the lobby be used for this purpose. <laughs> Notices in hotel bars. Special cocktails for ladies with nuts. <laughs> our, wines leave, <laughs> our wines leave you nothing to hope for. <laughs> Special today, no ice cream. <laughs> Notices in the hotel shop. If this is your first visit to Tokyo, you're welcome to it. Order your summer suit, because, is big rush, we will execute customers in strict <laughs> rotation. Teeth extracted by Methodists. Notices in hotel grounds. Stop, drive sideways. Please do not feed the animals. Give the money, uh, give the money, give the food to the guard on duty. Ladies, please leave your clothes here and spend the afternoon having a very good time. <laughs> Take one of our horse-driven tours. We guarantee no miscarriages. <laughs> Would you like to ride on your own ass? Spelt <laughs> A-R-S-E. <laughs> Travel agents. People who've been on holiday and they ring their travel agent. I was bitten by a mosquito and nobody told me they could bite. <laughs> On my holiday to Goa in India, I was disgusted to find that almost every restaurant served curry. We booked an excursion to a water park, but no one told us we had to bring our swimming costume and towels. The beach was too sandy. Topless sunbathing on the beach should be banned. The holiday was ruined as my husband spent all day looking at other women. <laughs> no one told us that there would be fish in the sea. My children were very frightened. My fiance and I had booked a twin bedded room, but we were placed in a double bedded, in double -bedded room. We now hold you entirely responsible for the fact that I find myself pregnant. <laughs> This would not have happened if you'd put us in the room that we wanted. The brochure states that no hairdressers at this accommodation. We are trainee hairdressers, so will it be okay if we stayed here? We found the sand was not like the sand in the brochure. In your brochure, the sand shows yellow, but when we got there, the sand was white. It is your duty as a tour operator to advise us of noisy or unruly guests before we travel. Now, these questions were posed from all over the world to the Australian Tourism website. And the answers are the actual responses by the website's official. And all I can say that their travel agencies obviously have a sense of humor. 
question from the USA. Will I be able to see kangaroos in the street when I visit Australia? Answer, depends how much you've been drinking. <laughs> Sweden, question, I want to walk from Perth to Sydney. Can I follow the railway tracks? Sure, it's only 3,000 miles, take a lot of water. <laughs> question, USA, which direction is north in Australia? Answer, face south, then turn 180 degrees. Contact us when you get there. We'll send you the rest of the directions. <laughs> Germany, question. Are there supermarkets in Sydney? And is milk available all year round? Answer, no. We're a peaceful civilization of vegan hunter-gatherers and milk is illegal. Final one, USA, question. Please send a list of all doctors in Australia who can dispense rattlesnake serum. Answer, rattlesnakes live in America, which is where you come from. All Australian snakes are perfectly harmless and they can be safely handled, make very good pets. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm going to have to put my glasses on to read these little bits. I found this the other day. I thought it was lovely. In Bahrain, these are ridiculous laws abroad. They were. They've probably changed a bit now. In Bahrain, a male doctor can legally examine a woman's genitals, but he must not view them directly. <laughs> Right? Instead, he must hold up a mirror and stare at the reflection. Right? When in France, you can't name your pig Napoleon. Take photographs of police officers or police vehicles, and between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., 70 pence of music on the radio must be by French artists. Homeschooling in Spain is not allowed, nor is tying down the trunk of a vehicle or listen to music with earplugs while you are thing. And this is my favourite one. In Hong Kong, a woman may legally kill her cheating husband if she uses her bare hands. The woman with whom the husband is cheating can be killed in any manner. Right, now, I'm not very good to go travelling with because things happen to me unfortunately. And when my dear husband was alive, he, we used to go away in trepidation because he'd wonder, oh, what is going to happen? So this is, I am writing, a, I'll call it a book, but I'm writing my experiences abroad. I don't think it'll ever be published, but anyway. But this is just a flavour of some of the things that have happened to me. I rescued a woman from drowning at Vancouver Aquarium. I stripped naked to deter a couple from continually harassing me. Being present at a tour guide's miscarriage and offering a small packet of wet wipes to her to sort of, well, I hadn't got anything else but some wet wipes, and the woman was, anyway. No. The thrush cream and explosives incident at Edinburgh Airport. <laughs> Clack off. The waitress, the tip and the mistaken identity and the imminent arrest for verbal abuse at Ramsgate train station. And that's just to name a few. But this is a good one. This one I've, all, this one I've already written. We're coming to the end now. This one I've already written and it's ready to go. Okay. Myself and my husband Ian. A holiday in the foothills of the Alps overlooking Nice, Monte Carlo, Caen, Grasse, the home of perfume, sunny days on the beach, French cuisine, French wine, bliss. Day of departure, dawned bright and clear. We arose at 4 a.m., set off for Portsmouth. The crossing was uneventful, not like some other ferry crossings we've made that involved the Japanese, a Tour de France catering van, being stuck in the lift, abandonment in the half, but no time to go into that. Now, do you remember the days when we didn't have sat-nav? Well, one wrote to the Automobile Association and they would send a route guide which gave step-by-step -step instructions of the journey with roads and their numbers and da-da-da-da-da-da. So I was armed with the AA route map. 
to direct us to Nice through the byways of rural France, avoiding the toll booths. And I was somewhat surprised when this route map was delivered because it was at least, was at least four inches thick. And, it, and you had it on your lap in the car like this, and you turned it, page one, of the two, page two, and there you went. It was fine. Um, so, Ian, my husband, had complete faith in my navigation and this AA map, so with confidence and a light foot on the gas, we journeyed and our journey began. This map and its written directions was incredible, and without it, we have not found our destination, and I shall blame the AA forever, because if it hadn't been so bloody good, we thankfully might never have found the N202 and Lantosque. I don't understand measurements in metres, so on reading the blurb on this the house, the Jeet's position, which read nestling 700 metres above sea level, it meant nothing to me. So when choosing it, so when at 11.30 at night, we picked up the road sign for Lantosque with a picture of a caravan, a lorry, and a high-sided vehicle with a big red cross going through it. Well, no alarm bells went off in my head. And as to the dangers of this road, we gleefully headed to our final destination. We were now he we're heading for the Gorge de Vesabi. Our headlamps picked out sheer drops of hundreds of feet with walls of ankle height for safety, hairpin bends and vertical rock walls towering above and over the road. This was the M2565, and all this horror accompanied with rain like stair rods and pitch blackness. We could barely see ahead of us or behind us, and after three minutes of this, I was crying with terror and wishing I'd booked for Bournemouth. And at the same time, all too aware that to get anywhere, we would have to drive out and then back through this bloody gorge de Vesabi. Over the next few days, we drove to Nice to find the beach. We could see it, but we couldn't actually find the exit to get off of the 10-lane motorway to actually get on the beach. So after three attempts, each of which involved driving through Nice Airport, we decided of the bloody sea and spend, sped back through the nightmare gorge to the safety of our jeep. Consequently, spending the first week swallowing tranquilizers by the bucket load to get up and back through the gorge, not getting to the sea, not really going anywhere in the car as it meant going down thousands of feet or up thousands of feet, not going out at night because it was so dark. Um, the first venture out to a little local loji to try and find some blooming alcohol, my husband kept tripping over and falling down holes. And at one point he fell six foot down this incline. And when I finally found him by the light of my little torch, he was lying in the sheet owner's pet cemetery. So, so we decided that we would stay in, stay home, stay safe. It was now Saturday. We'd been in Lantosk for three days. We'd sussed the beautiful area and our limitations, and I reckon things couldn't get better. And that day we ventured out, still pouring the rain, in the daylight hours, bought alcohol, French delicacies to sustain us. When we got back to the sheet, my husband broke open his jigsaw puzzle and I sat down on the bed to read my novel. Peace and serenity. This was it. Wonderful. It was on the Monday evening that the French army was flown in by helicopter and the whole area declared a national disaster. The first official emergency evacuation from the sheet was quite a normal affair as emergency evacuations go. My husband was having problems getting the car to start in monsoon conditions so that it could be moved from the path of hundreds of tons of water, boulders and torn up forests that were swiftly moving towards it. We managed, screaming in terror, sobbing hysterically. I grabbed the nearest suitcase and put some clothes in, but in my panic, I'd forgotten how to open a suitcase. The car was moved to about 200 feet uphill from where it was and into the garden of the home of the owner of the Jeep we were staying in and it was still monsoon conditions. The second emergency evacuation after we thought we were safe was a bit more involved. I'd not even managed a glass of fortifying cognac when four firemen burst into the house advising us that the water 200 meters above us was changing course and it was heading straight for us. 
So, we had to get out of his path and onto higher ground as quickly as possible. Now, the guard dog of the sheep was not happy in the back of our car. And my husband had managed to lift the huge bird cage full of buttery gauze onto our roof rack. And I helped the sheep owner herd at least seven cats into the back of his car. The dog was soaking wet and black with mud and sitting on all the clothes that I couldn't put into the suitcase because I'd forgotten how to open it. And the sound of the water coming towards us, I remember for the rest of my day, it was, I mean, joking apart, it was awful. And also my bloody fingers because I couldn't get the wrapping off the toppies, toffees that I was feeding this dog to try and calm the dog down. And it was so anxious for the toffees that it was trying to tear the paper off of the toffees the same time as I was. And so it bit all my fingers and they were all bleeding. We were not washed away. By some miracle, the water missed our sheet by about one and a half meters. However, there was no electricity for miles. Our exit from the mountains cut off. There were no telephones, no drinking water, no clean clothes to change into. Fortunately, this all happened during the day, so no lives were lost. And we spent the rest of our holiday helping the locals and the army clear up. The destruction to this lovely area was really heartbreaking. And during the week after, I met one of the firemen. He smiled brightly and embraced me. Oh, they can't! He chortled. I thumped him. And finally, to finish, a piece from Mark Twain. I have found out that there isn't no surer way whether you like people or hate them is to travel with them. Travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on those accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So, throw off the bow lines. Sail away from your safe harbour. Catch the trade winds in your sails. Explore, dream, and by all means, discover. Thank you very much.